that the Lord has made me rejoice and we're glad in it, for the Lord is good. Stand all over the building, please, if you don't mind. I want you to find somebody that looks better than you and tell them how good they look and how good it is. If you can't, just find somebody looking. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good to see all the people of God this morning. What a blessing it is that we are here to worship and we're not here for a funeral. We're not here for a sad service, but we're here to give God glory and praise. Let's greet our Father this morning. God, we thank you and we praise you. Come on, greet your Savior. God, we give you glory. We owe you this praise. I wonder, is there anybody in the room that can be a witness and say, I owe the Lord praise? Oh, come on, where are my witnesses at? Oh, I get to praise him. I owe him this praise. Come on, tell your neighbor, you owe him too. Come on, tell him. You know you owe him. You know you owe the Lord. And we give the Lord.
word. Oh, come on, put his name in your section. Your neighbor might not know him. Send Jesus down your road. Jesus on this road. Jesus in my section. Jesus in this building. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Lord has brought us over hills and mountains and everything that we are everything that we have it's all because of that name that we just got done calling every victory every triumph it's all because of him and on this last Sunday of the month I want us to sing to God the glory without the music everybody say to God sing it like you're victorious be the glory come on victorious people say to God be the glory for what for the things that he has now father we think this morning for everything that you have done. God, you've been good to us. You stayed the hand of death and gave us another chance to enter into your presence and we come here with thanksgiving in our hearts and with the praise on our lips ready to give you the glory. God, today touch, heal and deliver. You know what we stand in need of. You know every request spoken and unspoken. God, we pray this morning that we will have testimonies of miracles healings and deliverances today oh thank you Lord that you're going to move by your spirit thank you that you're going to move by your power thank you that you're going to show yourself strong thank you for another time another chance in your presence thank you that your word is going to go forth today with clarity and with power and thank you that I'll never be the same after this day and I give you the glory be with us as we go in the presence of this service in Jesus name Clap your hands and give them glory, everybody. Praise, praise the Lord, everybody. Um, on, in 1926, there was a man by the name of Carter G. Woodson who started Negro History Week as a means to celebrate and commemorate black Amer Americans who had contributed to um, things within the United States of America. Um, well, as this week would go about and gain momentum over the years in 1976, it became an, a national holiday uh, that was instituted by the president at that time, and it became an entire month celebration. Um, so we can give it up for that. We can give it up for that. Now, something we wanted to do uh, with the Department of Worship Arts today is we wanted to commemorate of artists in gospel music who have made so many contributions to not only the gospel music industry, but to blues and to hip hop and things of that nature. Uh, there have been so many um, African Americans who have made contributions to these spaces. Um, even we can go from gospel to blues to country to R&B to rap. Um, I know some of you who are even Gen Zers or millennial uh, millennials. You may know the, the Cardi B's and the uh, Meg the Stallions and people of that nature. Uh, but before all of them, there was a woman by the name of Harriet Tubman who sung the original gangster rap. I ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. So today, particularly, we wanna come away from gangster rap and come back to gospel. <laughs> And we want to celebrate a man by the name of Richard Smallwood, born in 1948, who uh, got his degree from uh, HBCU, Howard University, where he majored in piano. Well, um, Richard Smallwood, he would start in music at an early age, about five years old. And at 11, 
he got his first gospel choir and he was highly trained in piano and we know him from one of his most celebrated pieces that has become one of the most popular songs of comfort within not just the black church but the church as a whole and you may know it he said um, I lift my hands in total praise to now, Richard Smallwood wrote this song because at the time he was dealing with a terminal illness with his mother. He was dealing with um, mental illness with his real brother and also mental illness with his God, with his stepbrother. And in this time, he referred to a passage in Psalms. And in that passage, he started to sing, God, you are the source of my strength. You're the strength of my life. And the only thing I can do as a response to my weakness is lift my hands in complete and total praise. So, we absolutely, I'm going to be quiet now. Most of y'all know I'm a history professor. I can talk about this all day. Uh, but um, we know that we've come such a long way in this country. But we also know that we have a long way to go. But we want to perform, minister a piece by Richard Smallwood uh, that encourages the things, the ailments that we're dealing with in this country that simply says there is healing for us. There is healing for your soul. There is healing for your mind. If you won't just touch the person to your left or to your right and just tell them there is healing. There is healing.
his hands on me. I was a single mother with two daughters and facing a second foreclosure. It's probably the lowest point I've ever experienced in my life. I never thought I would be homeless. It took being broken first in order to be blessed. There is hope. In order to know that there is light, you have to experience the dark. Even in the brokenness, there's a blessing in there. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Hey family, this is Pastor Jennifer, lead pastor here at Jackson Revival Center Church. Let me just say I am elated that you have chosen to worship with us here today. Deuteronomy 8.1 said, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do, that you may live, that you may multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. I want you to look at this because it blessed me real good. What do I have to do? I have to observe to do. Why? In order that I may live, that I may multiply, that I may go in, not only go in, but possess the land. Oh, that blessed me right there. He said, if you would just pay attention to the things that I have told you to do, he said, you will live, you will multiply, you will go in and possess the land. Then he goes on in at Deuteronomy 8 verse 10 and said, and when you have eaten and are full, make sure you bless the Lord your God for the land that he has given unto you. Here's the how, observe to do what I've told you to do. Here's the why, I want you to live, I want you to multiply, I want you to go in, I don't want you standing on the outside, I want you to go in and I want you to take the land. What, when you get there, he said, don't forget that it was God who got you there. Bless him for the land that he has given unto you. Friend, that's what it's all about. When we come and we give, number one, we're observing to do the things that God has told us to do. But it's not about him getting something from us. It's about him getting something to us. He said, if you'll observe to do what I've told you to do, he said, you'll live, you'll multiply, you'll go in and you will possess the land. So friend, I would like to issue you an invitation now to join me as we observe to do what God has commanded us to do through his word. For those of you who would like to give, 
live here in the building. There are offering receptacles along the walls and also in the lobby. Our ushers are here and they would be more than happy to assist you with your giving. For those of you who would like to give by text to give, you can simply text 28950. That's 28950. Type in keyword JRCT and the amount that you would like to give for your tithe, JRCO, and the amount you would like to give for your offering, and JRC Build and the amount that you would like to give into our building fund. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. We thank you for sending your word. Your word is there to teach us, to instruct us, to direct us. And Father, you said when we observe to do those things that you have commanded us to do, we will live, we will multiply, we'll go in and possess the land. So Father, we pray now your blessing upon everything that is given upon each and every person who gives. Let every household, Father, even attached to this house, let them be blessed beyond measure. We thank you that the hand of the enemy is rebuked on every side and and we thank you for your blessings now and forevermore. Father, we give you the praise for the opportunity to give, for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the many blessings you bestowed upon us, but we don't forget what we have came from you. So we come now to honor you with the fruit of our substance and the first portion of all of our increase. Bless it, multiply it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Hey, may God bless you now as you join me in giving.
King of kings and Lord of lords, lifter of your head, healer of your heart, keeper of your mind, friend that sticks closer than a brother, Rose of Sharon, Lily of the Valley, kinsman, redeemer. Come on, if you know him to be a way out of no way. Hallelujah. Come on and open up your mouth and give God praise all over the house this morning. Jackson Revival Center. We send a good, good morning to our Rankin County Satellite Facility. Good morning to all of the ladies who are joining us this morning from the Rankin County Correctional Facility. We send a shout out to Elder John McClellan who is there ministering this morning. We've got a few prayer requests that we want to lift before the Lord. Uh, we want to keep Sister Lauren's sister before the Lord who was in an accident on last night and so we lift her up we want to continue to lift up sister josephine eichelberger and her family uh, as they celebrated her brother's home going on yesterday and then while they were here for the repast uh, brother floyd uh, eichelberger collapsed and ended up going to the emergency room he was released on last night but we do want to continue to keep he and his family lifted in prayer uh, we want to pray for Brother Joshua McLean, uh, also who had to go to the emergency room. And we just want to keep all of these needs lifted before the Lord in prayer. And there may be needs in the congregation this morning. And if you've got a need, if you would, just lift up your hand. The comfort we have is in knowing that no matter what we need, God knew what we needed even before we asked. And so we're going to lift up the requests that have been made known and we're going to lift up the requests that are unknown and we're going to expect God to meet us there. We can expect him because he's faithful and he's right on time. So Heavenly Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place today. Father, we thank you for the glorious and the exuberant celebration. Father, we celebrate black history. We celebrate, Father those who have worked so hard to build this country father and to make it what it is we celebrate every contribution father we thank you for the sacrifices that have been made lord we thank you for those who have labored before us and father we ask right now that your blessing would be upon each and every person connected to this service today father we lift up every request that has been made known father we lift up every family that that is grieving the loss of a loved one. Father, we lift up every family who is hurting right now. Father, we thank you that you will embrace them, that you will wrap your arms around them. Father, that you would give the peace that passes all understanding, that you would meet and supply each and every need. Father, we lift up Lauren's sister to you right now. We ask that you would touch her from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. We lift up Brother Floyd. We lift up Brother Joshua we lift up everyone who needs a touch in their body we thank you that you are the great physician and father we thank you that healing is the children's bread father we receive freely right now healing for our bodies we receive right now healing for our spirit we receive right now with meekness the engrafted word of God do what you want to do in this house today have your way throw your weight around walk up and down these aisles visit every heart touch everybody father give us ears to hear and hearts to receive and father when we leave this place today let us leave knowing that we have been in the presence of the Lord let us leave knowing we have heard from you and Lord we'll be careful to give you the glory the honor and the praise it's in Jesus name that we pray and expect results everybody in agreement said amen Amen and amen. 
Well, we want to let everybody know that we will have corporate prayer one week from today. Next Sunday evening at 5 o'clock, we will have corporate prayer. And I just thank God for what he does every time we come together. Uh, I didn't get to be at the last one because I was at home uh, recovering from COVID, but I'll be at the next one. And so next Sunday at 5 o'clock, uh, we will be having corporate prayer. So I want everybody to make plans to be here. Uh, those of you who would like to go with us today will be leaving uh, right after service at 1 o'clock to go to Fayette, Mississippi to celebrate the 20th church anniversary of Pastors Michael and Faye Brown and Raining Manor Christian Center. 20 years as a church and we celebrate with them. Uh, he and she are sons and daughters of this house. They are under the covering of our church. And so we want to go and make today a special day for them. And so those of you who want to go, you're welcome to go. Those of you who can't go, uh, we ask that you would cover us in prayer for traveling grace and mercy. Uh, we'll have about five vans on the road along with uh, individuals taking their cars. And so uh, we're believing God for a safe trip there and back and for a good time in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Well, I want you to look over at somebody and just tell them, God has got plans for me. I want you to look back at them and tell them God has got plans for you. Hallelujah. I don't know if that excites anybody in the house this morning. I need somebody to know God's got plans for you. I want you to grab your Bible, if you will. Let's go to Genesis chapter 6, verse 14. Genesis chapter 6, verse 14. Uh, and Jeremiah 29 11 you can put your hand uh, in those two as you grab them real quick uh, one verse in Genesis one verse in 29 11 of Jeremiah and then we'll move right on uh, as you were looking for those passages of scripture uh, we want to give God glory for the ministry gift of Elder Frederick Burns who did an amazing job on last Sunday morning uh, we thank God for the move of God in the place. And I'm telling you, it makes me feel good as a pastor to be able to be where I need to be, uh, doing what I need to be doing and know that the house is taken care of. And so we thank God for sons and daughters of the house who are capable of carrying the service and allowing God to have his way. So we give God glory for you, Elder Burns. Genesis chapter 6, verse 14. Genesis chapter 6, verse 14. I'm going to be reading from the NIV version. It says, so make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. You can be seated. I want to begin this morning by informing some and reminding others that God has a plan for your life. You may be in a place right now where you're scratching your head and wringing your hands, but I need you to know in the midst of whatever it is you're facing, God has a plan for your life. I'm not standing before you this morning trying to say something churchy because it's Sunday morning, but I come boldly this morning. I come with great confidence. I come with great assurance because I've eavesdropped on a conversation that God had with a young prophet by the name of Jeremiah. And God spoke to the people of God through a young prophet of God and said in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have have for you declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you a future and a hope now this is a verse that we have heard we've seen it on coffee mugs we've read it on uh, prayer cards we've seen it on refrigerator magnets but the thing that makes this verse so powerful is not just what God says but it's when God says it uh, he says this to a group of people who are in exile their native land has been invaded by enemies that 
their homes have been set on fire. Their villages have been burned to the ground. They have lost their things. Many have lost their lives. And then for those who did survive the siege, they were taken by force into foreign territory. They were taken in chains and separated from their countries by authoritative decrees, by force, and in a place where it felt as if their whole life was falling apart, in a place where they were pressed on every side, at a time that they were oppressed and depressed and suppressed. It was bad, y'all, discouraged and disoriented, but right there, right at the end of their rope, God comes and touches a young prophet by the name of Jeremiah on the shoulder and said, tell them I've got plans for them. Oh, I need you to look over at somebody and tell them God's got plans for you. Ah, uh, you got to understand God did not tell Jeremiah what the plans were. He didn't say, you know the plans I have for you. He said, I know the plans that I have for you. He said, tell them I got plans for them, plans to prosper them, not to harm them, plans to give them hope, plans to give them a future. And what this lets me know is that our current situation is not our future day destination that how it is right now is not how it's always going to be meaning that the place you are in right now is not a period in your life it is a comma in the sentence of the book of your life and God is getting ready to do something on the other side of the comma oh I need you to look over at somebody people might be looking at you crazy right now but just tell them catch me on the other side of the comma catch me on the other side of the comma I might be low right now I might be discouraged right now but just stick around and catch me on the other side of the comma this is not the end but this is the beginning of the best season of my life he said I know the plans that I have for you declares the Lord plans to prosper you not to harm you to give you a hope and a future I want to talk to some people today who may feel like you are experiencing your own metaphorical exile it may not be a literal exile but it may be a metaphorical exile that there were people who didn't even survive the sea there were people who did not make it through. And if you just look over the last few chapters of your life, you will realize that there are some people who didn't even make it through what you have made it through. And then there were those who did make it through what you've made it through. But those who made it through in our text were taken captive and were held against their will in another land. So they are in this uh, peculiar place where they are grateful that they survived but looking and saying but surely I didn't survive for this has anybody ever been in a place where you were grateful that you survived the thing but you're looking at your life and saying but surely I didn't survive for this surely surely the Lord didn't keep me here to struggle like I'm struggling surely the Lord didn't keep me here uh, to just barely make it from one day to the next day surely the Lord didn't keep me here for folks to act funny and for my money to be funny and my change to be straight. Surely the Lord didn't hold me here for this. Anybody ever been in a place where you are grateful for the things that God has brought you through? Anybody ever just been grateful that you have overcome things that other people succumb to? And, and you've ever been in a place that 
faith, you say, you know, I'm grateful for that. But if I were really honest with you, if I just kept it 100 all the way, uh, I'm grateful, but I'm also in a place that I'm frustrated. Okay, it's just about three of us up in here today. I'm, I'm grateful for what God has done. I'm, I'm grateful for how faithful God has been. But, but there's something that is deep down on the inside telling me that there's, there's more. There's, there's a longing on the inside. And what I've come to understand is that that longing is God saying, I've got plans for you. I've got plans. Plans for you, plans not to harm you, not to hurt you, but plans to prosper you and to give you a hope and a future. And because I have plans, God is saying I will not allow you to become too comfortable in a place that I never intended to allow you to settle in. Uh, because if I allow you to become too comfortable, you will want to stay in what you were intended to pass through. So God said, I'll give you some divine agitation and some holy frustration. Uh, so that will be an indicator that where you are in your life is not the totality of everything that God wants to do. You are not the totality and the total fulfillment of who God has called you to be. So God said, I'm just going to mess with you a little bit and, and I'm going to start uh, pushing on you a little bit and I'm going to give you a want to anybody ever had God to give you a want to that you didn't want to have God said I'm not going to just give you uh, what your heart desires but I'm going to tell your heart what to desire See, 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 some of the stuff you want, it really ain't even you wanting what you think you want. Some of the stuff you want, God said, I put the want to in you. But I can't get it for you just by me wanting it for you. So I've got to cultivate a desire in you to want it for yourself. I came on a Sunday morning to tell you stop acting like you don't want it. Stop, stop that false humility. Stop acting like you don't want it. Stop talking like you don't want it. That lacks integrity. It lacks authenticity. Just go on and admit that I want everything that God says belongs I want everything that God said belongs to me. And see, for a long time, Erica, I thought it was wrong to have ambition. I thought it was wrong to want something. But then I found out that the Bible didn't say that. The Bible said it's wrong to have vain ambition. You got to have ambition even to want to be a better Christian. You got to have some ambition to want to be a better woman of God or a better man of God. So stop acting like you don't want nothing stop talking like you don't want nothing stop that false humility and just open up your mouth and say I want everything God said belongs to me now the truth is some people may not want it some people may be all right where you are. Some people may be okay to settle. But when God puts a want to on the inside of you, you want what you want because what you want is what he needs. Hannah wanted a child, but God needed a Samuel. Oh yeah, Abraham wanted a son, but God needed a 
and Isaac. Sarah wanted a child, but God needed an Isaac. There's nothing wrong with you wanting what God has put within your heart, the desire to want. So he puts a want to on the inside of you so that when you produce what you want, you're also producing what God needs in the earth. Oh, somebody just got free. I dare about 50 folk to say, I want it. I want it. And if you don't want it, that's okay, but I need you to be okay with me saying, I want everything God said belongs to me because God's got plans for me. God's got plans for you. And so he gives you a want to for that. We we all have to be faithful to who God has called us to be, our idea, our understanding. But there is something that I need you to know about God's plan. Does anybody want it? Anybody in a place where you're saying, look, I'm too old. I've been in this thing too long for me to still be playing with what? No, I need to know. I want the plan. I want to hear. Some of God's plans are preferences. Some of God's plans are the things he wants to do, the things he is willing to do, the things he is committed to doing. It's, it's what he wants for you, but here's the deal. He will not force it on you. Some of the imagery that the Bible uses to teach us about God is a shepherding imagery. And, and a shepherd leads, but a shepherd does not force. And so God said, I want to take you to another, another level, but I cannot force you there. I want to take your mind to another level, but I cannot force you there. I want to take your heart to another level, but I cannot force you there. I, I want to take your life to another place, but I cannot force you there. You got to understand that God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son that you would have salvation, but he does not force force you even there that he's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance and yet he does not force that on you he says I am God enough to want to see you live on the next level but I respect your free will enough to allow you to live on whatever level you settle for anybody in here today who has made up your mind that your settling season is over it is it's about 40 of y'all I'm thank, thankful for the 40 of y'all who have made up in your mind settling season is over I want God's perfect will for my life but the thing we have to understand is that some of God's plans require our participation that his plans require our faith, our, our willingness to participate is an expression of our faith. Now, one thing you got to understand is that faith is not optimism. It can produce optimism, but you can be optimistic without having faith in God. You can be optimistic without even believing in God. So faith is not optimism. Faith also is not positive thinking. It affects our thinking. But faith is not positive thinking because you can have positive thinking without faith. So faith also, and I pray y'all don't get mad at me, but faith also is not manifestation. Faith can produce a manifestation, but faith itself is not manifestation. The Bible said faith without works is dead. That, that an indication of my faith is that I'm ready to put some work behind what I believe.
believe that, that, that faith without some corresponding action is dead on the floor. Pastor Tony Evans said, faith is acting like what God said is true. And, and, and this is how some people are discombobulated over how calm you can be in a crisis. That, that they're trying to figure out how you're not stressed out. They're, they're trying to figure out how is it that you're going through what you're going through but you're not falling apart. They're, they're trying to figure out how are you so cool? How are you so calm? How are you so collected? They don't understand. I'm just standing here acting like what God said is true I'm, the reason why I'm praising God in the midst of my pain is that I'm just standing here lifting my hand acting like I believe that what God said is absolutely true the reason that I'm not losing my wits is because I'm standing here acting like what I believe God said is true And here is the truth. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Here's the truth. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment shall be condemned. Here's the truth. Your enemy might come at you one way, but that joker going to meet the presence of God and have to flee seven ways. Here's the truth. God will do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can can ask, think, or imagine. Here's the truth. You are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who loved you and gave himself for you. Faith is acting like what God said is true. I believe it. I'm persuaded. I'm standing in it, standing on it, standing behind it. I know if he said it, it will surely I dare you just to look at somebody and say, I believe what is said is true. And one of the most powerful examples of this is found in the book of Genesis with the story of Noah. And I'm not going to go real deep this morning into a lot of the theological wrestlings that are associated with this text. I'm not going to talk about uh, the reason for the flood and all the redemptive nature of it. But there are some simple things that we can pull from this story because it lets us look that, that there was a time that God looked at the human species and said, look, this thing is not operating in a way that is consistent with my original intent and so God said we're going to have to start over and sometimes renovation requires demolition uh, y'all don't want to y'all don't want to go with me this morning Y'all, y'all see, we got some construction projects going on right now. We're, we're finishing above the multi-purpose center, but, but sometimes you don't get things right the first time. And sometimes if you want to renovate something and get it to where it needs to be, before you can renovate, you got to demolish some stuff. There's some tearing down and some carrying out. But, but my question to you this morning is, if God can start a fresh why can't you start afresh oh y'all didn't like that uh, how is it that you can stand and, and read this word and say, no, it's just too far gone. It's, it's just too bleak. No, if God can start again, you can start again. And so we see through, through the story uh, in Genesis that there was a man by the name of Noah. And the Bible says that Noah found favor with God. And that favor that Noah found with God expressed itself through God sharing with Noah some insider information. That, that God tells Noah, he said, Noah, it's, it's going to rain. 
and then God, God shares with Noah, this, this is what you're going to have to do in order to survive. That, that, that God told him it was going to rain, but God also told him what to do, how to build, when to build and God told him to build something that would protect him and something that would protect his family in the midst of the rain. God told Noah to build the ark and yet God never picked up one hammer. Some of the things that God sees for your life, some of the plans that he has for you, you have to understand God is the original architect. God is the architect, but you are the general contractor. That, that the architect designs the building. The, the architect shares with you the plans of what a particular thing has the potential to be. But the success of the building is not just based on who the architect is. The, the success of the building is not just based on the blueprint, but the success of the building is also dependent upon the builders. I just wonder if I got any builders in the house this morning because the builder has to build according to the blueprint. God is our architect and he has not put his plan for your life just on paper, but God has put his plan for your life in your heart. And so if you are going to experience what you see in your heart, if you are going to walk in God's plans for your life, you are going to have to do some building. What do you see for your life? You're going to have to build it. What do you see for your marriage? You're going to have to build it. What do you see for your business? Because you have to build it. What do you see for your church? Because we have to build it. What do you see for your children? Because you have to build it. And the situation is that God gives the blueprint. But it is you and I that do the building. But except we partner with God to do it, we labor in vain. I just wonder if there's anybody in here today who is willing to say, I'm building something. I wonder if there's anybody in here today who said, God has plans for me. Now, as far as we know it, Noah has no prior construction experience. As far as we know, Noah doesn't even know that there is a builder on the inside of him. Yet God places a demand on something on the inside of Noah that Noah didn't even know was there yet. <laughs> Jacob didn't know there was an Israel on the inside of him. Sarai didn't know there was a Sarah on the inside of her. There, there is some stuff in you that you have not even discovered yet. Uh, there's a wiser you in you. There's a stronger you in you. There's a more loving you in you. There is a more trusting you in you. But we look at this story and Noah has no prior construction experience. But if you look in verse 14 of chapter 6, God told Noah, you shall build an ark for yourself. You shall build an ark for 
yourself. That's, that's God's way of saying, look, son, uh, this is something that I'm not going to be able to do for you. I want it for you, but I can't do it for you. And one way that the devil shows up is through distraction. That there's a distraction here and a distraction there and a distraction over here and a distraction back there. And there are some of us who want to build. There are some of us who are able to build but have trouble building because there are too many distractions trying to interrupt the building process. But I need you to look over at somebody and say it's building season. And tell them if you can see it, you can see it because you are able to build it. Oh, I want to talk to somebody who's got a vision for your life. I want to talk to somebody who has had God disrupt your sleep at night. I want to talk to somebody who knows what it is to carry something in your heart and to carry something in the womb of your spirit. I want to, I want to see somebody who knows what it is that God will keep tapping you on the shoulder and saying, remember what I showed you? Remember, will I add this to it and add this to that and Prepare this over here and prepare this over there because God has plans for you. And God will place a demand on a version of you that you have not even met yet and he does it by beginning to give you responsibilities that you haven't had yet. Anybody ever find yourself in a place where you're doing stuff you ain't never had to do before and it's uncomfortable and it's unfamiliar and yet you know you are right in the middle of what God is speaking concerning your life? Noah doesn't just show us that we need to build, but he gives us clues concerning what we need in order to build. And so I want to quickly give you five things, five things that you need in order to build whatever you are building. If you're working on building your family, this is five things you're going to need to build your family. If you're working on building your marriage, this is five things you're going to need to build your marriage. If you're building a business, this is five things you're going to need to build your business. If you're building ministry, five things you're going to need to build. The first thing you're going to need is truth. Truth is reality. And John Mark Comer said, truth is what you run into when you're wrong. Oh, y'all ain't going to like a white girl on a Sunday morning. But see, there are some times that you think you've got the truth concerning a particular thing. Oh, she's so sweet. Oh, he's so handsome. Oh, this is so good. Oh, that's so easy. Oh, they got it made until you get a chance to do what they do and suddenly you run into truth and find out this ain't quite as easy as I thought it was. This this ain't quite as pleasant as I thought. Oh, my Lord. And yet the Bible said in John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So if the truth makes you free, the opposite must also be true. That when I am living my life and the life that I'm living is not according to truth, then I'm bound. If I'm living a life that is not according to truth, I'm, I'm limited. And so the first thing God gave Noah was truth. What did he tell him? It's going to rain. I know, Noah, you have never seen rain before. I know that you may not like what I'm telling you. I know there's not a cloud in the sky, but it's going to rain. 
And so what I need you to do uh, in order to survive, in order for your family to survive, is that I need you to build something that is going to allow you to float in a flood. Can I tell you something? That's not just God's word to Noah, but that's God's word to me and you. I came to let somebody know this morning, it's going to rain. you say, well, pastor, what does rain represent? Well, in some instances, rain represents burdens. And in some instances, rain represents blessings. So we got to look right here because Noah needed the truth. Because a lot of times things start out a certain way and everything is looking all good and everybody is in love. But at some point, it's going to rain. And I know God gave you this great idea for a business and you were blowing and you were going, but at some point, it's going to rain. And I know you are anointed and appointed and you are the answer that the world has been waiting for. But at some point, it's going to rain. And my question to you is a question New Edition posed to us some years back. And that question is, can you stand the rain? Storms will come. This we know. And my question is, can you stand the rain? I know y'all like each other, but if one of y'all gets sick, can you stand the rain? I know you're on top of the world right now, but if you lose your job, can you stand? If your children make decisions that disrupt your whole family, I got a question, can you Because when you believe that it's gonna rain, you build an ark. And, and here's the thing, Hubbard, if you're like me, you want to build it so strong that when the flood does come and when other people drown, you and everything attached to you is still floating. It might be raining, but you are floating because God is keeping your head above the water. You, you need truth. And not only do you need truth, but you need tools. And here's the thing. You don't need the same tools for every season. You need tools that are specific to the season that you're in. And there are some people who are in sowing season. A, a saw is for the things that need to be cut off. And I don't know about you, but I'm in a season where I have lost my tolerance for foolishness. I'm, I'm in a season where I'm cutting off negativity. I'm cutting off cynicism. I'm cutting off toxicity. I'm cutting off people who don't believe God. I hadn't gotten beside myself. I don't think I'm better than you. I'm not acting funny. But at this point in my life, there are just some things that I'm cutting off because if I don't cut it, it won't get cut. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're saying, well, no, Pastor, I don't need a saw. Maybe you need a hammer. Maybe, maybe you need to apply pressure in some areas. A, a hammer is so that you can drive a nail from one thing into another thing in order to hold things together. That there are some things that will come together if you just apply enough pressure. 
Let me go on and tell you there are some people who are going to be sick of you by the time this season is over because truth be told, they sick of you now and you haven't even applied the pressure yet. Just look over at your neighbor and say, don't get too thrown off. I'm about to apply some pressure. I'm almost done. I ain't going to be before you long today. Uh, maybe, maybe you say, no, the saw ain't it for me. No, the hammer ain't it for me. Maybe you need a level. Maybe you've been living life unlevel and out of balance too long. My, my daddy built houses for 16 years and, and we could be sitting in a restaurant and he would be looking over at a corner and he would say they didn't use a level. They must have just been eyeing that. They just going by what they see. And see, there are some, some seasons where you cannot afford just to go by what you see. Uh, there are some seasons where you need a level. You've been out of balance too long. You're in a season where it's been all withdrawals and no deposits. And it's bankrupting you. It's not straight. It's unlevel. And it's not unfair. And it's not unselfish to come to the realization that this might be your season to level up. Because I'm not good for God or anybody else if I stay in a place where it's all withdrawals and no deposits. Maybe, maybe some are in a painting season where all you need is a brush. There are some seasons where God will give you a brush because he can make the same thing look like a new thing. If you'll, if you'll grab a paintbrush, God don't have to give you something new in order to do something new. Uh, you, you need truth. You need tools. You also need a team. Uh, our, our culture lives in extremes of either codependence or a hyper-independence. That, that, that we have to be careful uh, about this uh, running around here talking about, I don't need anybody, I got Jesus. I don't need anybody, I got God. You might think it makes you sound cute, you might think it sounds deep. You might think it makes us think you are super religious. But while you're running around here talking about long, long, long as I got King Jesus, I don't need anybody else. Yes, you do. Biblically, the Bible encourages us toward interdependence. God is the only one who has all things within himself. And the Apostle Paul describes it like body parts. He said, we are one body with many parts, and each part works interdependently, one with the other, that, that one is an eye and one is an ear. And God was intentional about not giving one person everything. So Paul warned against hyper-individualism in Corinth. You say, well, pastor, I'm good. I got friends. <laughs> well, having friends don't mean you have a team. <laughs> having friends might mean you got company, but it don't mean you got a team. <laughs> having friends might mean you got somebody to go to lunch with, but it don't mean you got a team. I'm praying for each and every one of you that for what God has given you to build, he's going to put some co-workers and some co-laborers around you, people to build with, people who have what you don't have. We all need a team. 
You need truth. You need tools. You need a team. The next thing you need is timing. I'm almost done. When Noah completed the ark, the rain came down. And God knew how long the construction process would take. And God began to deal with Noah in a way that he could start construction and complete construction before the rain came. And you may not know when the rain is going to come, but God does. So he tells you to start building because he knows heaven is going to open up at some point and you are going to need the ark that God is telling you to build. And my question to you this morning is, what is God tapping you on the shoulder telling you to build? What, what is God tapping you on the shoulder and speaking to your heart about I, I don't know what God is speaking to your heart about I don't know what God is nudging you about but whatever God is talking to you about your future requires it your family's future requires it and this brings me to my last and final thing you need truth, you need tools, you need timing, you need tenacity. Tenacity is the willingness to keep building when there are no clouds and not a drop of rain in the sky. There have been times in our lives, there have been times in our ministry where we've been grateful but frustrated. Some of y'all who were with us on Porter Street, some of us who were with us on West Silas Brown, you know what it is to be in a place where you're grateful but you're frustrated. What it is to be in times where your output didn't line up with your input. That, that there have been times where the harvest we reaped didn't seem to match the seeds that we had sown. And it's hard and you try to be faith-filled and you try to be enthusiastic and you try to be optimistic. But sometimes life and sometimes life situations seem to steal all of that away. And you're still standing, but it hasn't been easy. And you've got this wrestling in your soul that's telling you there still has to be something more you're who I want to talk to today it might not be everybody but it's somebody and I want to tell that somebody who's in here today keep building anyway I want to I want to tell that somebody in here today that you need to go back and look at why you started doing it in the first place and you need to have the tenacity of Jacob who said, I will not let go until you bless me. Family, I came to tell you this morning, the Lord said the rain is coming. Keep building because I can see a cloud the size of a man's hand. And I don't know when it's coming, but I know God is faithful. I don't know how it's coming, but I know that God has a way of making good on his word. David said, never have I seen the righteous forsaken. Never have I seen his seed begging for bread. It's going to rain. And I came to let somebody know this morning that God has plans for you. I know you might be in a place where it seems your village has been burned to the ground. I know you might be in a place where it seems you've lost everything that you hold dear. I know 
know that you may be in a place where you are in a place of exile, but I came to let you know right in the midst of where you are, God's got plans for you. God's got plans for you, baby girl. God's got plans for you, man of God, plans to prosper you. I know you may not have two nickels to rub together, but God's got plans for you. I know they might have just foreclosed last week, but I came to let you know the same God that gave you that one can give you one better. God still has plans for you, and his plans for you are to prosper you, to give you a hope, and to give you a future. I just wish I had 20 folk who could believe the word of the Lord this morning. Tap your neighbor and say, God's got plans for you. God's got plans for me and those plans are good. Oh yeah, those plans are good. He said, I got it all worked out. Is there a plan to harm you? Nowhere in the blueprint is there a plan to take you. I've got plans for you. I've got a blueprint all laid out. And everything here is to prosper you, to give you hope, and to bring you into a glorious future. I just need you to slap five people a high five and tell them God's got plans for us. you. God's got plans for me and the plans are good. I wish I had 50 more folk who would roll your sleeves up and just say, Lord, I thank you for a plan. You got a contractor here ready to work. You got a contractor here ready to follow the blueprint. You got a contractor here saying, give me a hammer, give me a saw, give me some nails, give me some tools, and let's get this thing done. I can see it because I'm anointed to build it. I can see it because God said I can have it. I can write the vision and make it plain because God put in me the want to do what he wanted me to do. God gave me a want to to build what he needs in the earth. Oh, I want you to slap two or three more people. Tell them I'm building something. I'm building something. I'm building something and tell them I'm not going to leave here the same way that I came. I came in a little tired this morning. I came in a little lethargic this morning. Hot but ready, I'm now to build. Yeah, I'm ready to build something. I'm ready to hammer something. I'm ready to cut something. I'm ready to saw something. I'm ready to sand something. I'm ready to paint something. I'm ready to get this show on the road. Friday night. I'm preaching this morning. I got to preach this afternoon. So I'm not telling you about something I heard about. I'm telling you something I know. I know what it is to have to depend on God to give you the want to. I know what it is to have to depend on God to give you the strength to what he gave you the want to to do. But I want to pray this morning for every person who is in a building phase, who has gotten discouraged in the process. And I want to pray for every ministry leader this morning. 
every leader in this place who leads an auxiliary ministry, I want to pray for you this morning. I want you, I don't care what your post is, leave it. And you can come down here because you deserve a moment. You deserve an opportunity. I want every person who leads a ministry to come. These are the ones who are always in the background. These are the ones who are always preferring their brothers to themselves. These are the ones who always sit back and sacrifice so that everybody else can get theirs. These are the ones who come early and stay late. These are the ones who give up their seats. These are the ones who park way down by the multi-purpose because we prefer visitors. These are the ones who pay house notes and car notes that nobody ever knows about. These are the ones who keep folks out of foreclosure. These are the ones who visit the hospital at 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning. These are the ones who will give up a trip to the movie to go to the hospital to make sure someone understands they're cared for. These are the ones who go to the nursing homes. These are the ones who help people in legal situations. These are the ones. The ones who come when their body is racked with pain. The ones who will give their last dime to see somebody else get their best. I love these men and women of God right here. And I want y'all to know how much I appreciate you. I want you to know how much I honor you. I want you to know how much I respect the work that you do. I want you to understand how valuable you are, how important you are, and how much value you add to what God is building in this place. And I want to pray for you today. And all the people that we pray for week after week after week are going to put their hands toward you. And we're going to pray for you today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I want Pastor Steve to come as well. Matter of fact, I want you to come stand up here, Pastor Steve, Minister Denise. I want y'all to come. And we're going to pray. Pastor Steve will be undergoing surgery on Tuesday. The cancer has returned. And I don't say his cancer because it ain't his. You've never been the kind of ministry to hide things from the flock. But Pastor Steve will be undergoing surgery on Tuesday. He will have some additional uh, treatment after Tuesday. And so what we're going to do is keep he and his wife and his family lifted in prayer. We're standing in faith. We're speaking the word of God concerning his situation. And I believe that because God said it, I'm going to stand in it like I know that it's true. No weapon formed against him shall be able to prosper. Healing is the children's bread. And the word of God said if we ask for healing, God would not for bread give us a stone. If we ask for fish, he would not give us a serpent. That in other words, if you ask for one thing, God won't give you something contrary to what you asked. And so I'm going to anoint you first. Hallelujah. And I'm going to anoint your wife and I'm going to anoint your hands as I anoint your hands. I'm anointing your children as they are an extension of you. And Father, I pray right now for the peace that surpasses natural understanding. Father, I thank you right now for a blessed assurance. I thank you for a God for dense. I thank you for a stand of faith that is not easily shaken. I thank you for a stand of faith that will not waver. Father, I thank you right now that 
your word is sure. I thank you that your word is true. And Father, in a moment where the harvest doesn't seem like it matches up to the seed that has been sown, Father, we continue to stand because we understand you've got tomorrow worked out even before you had today worked out. We thank you that you have plans for us, that those plans are not to harm us, that those plans are to prosper us and to give us a hope and to give us a future. So Father, we stand in faith and we stand boldly declaring you've got plans for us. And those plans are good. Father, I lift up every leader at this altar. Father, I lift up those whose heads are weary and whose fingers and feet and hands are feeble. I lift up those who are discouraged and hurting. Those who feel disconnected and discombobulated and disoriented. And Father, I thank you right now that you are doing a settling in their spirit. Father, that they will not settle for, but they will settle in your perfect will concerning their life. Father, I anoint them even now. I thank you, Lord, that the wrestling is over. I thank you for peace. I thank you for wisdom. I thank you, Lord, that he will not be tossed to and fro. But Father, that you will give clarity where there's confusion. That you would give peace where there's chaos. You got plans for us. And those plans are good. Father, I arrest every spirit of discouragement. I arrest every spirit that would minimize the efforts that are being made and have been made arrest every spirit that would say what you're doing does not matter. I arrest every spirit that would say you're not good enough. You don't measure up. I arrest every lying spirit that says you'll never get it right. And Father, we release right now encouragement. We release right now a fresh flow of the oil of your anointing we release right now a fresh pour a fresh oil father for those who have encouraged others and given all of their courage away i thank you lord that where they're empty you will fill them and father where they have given you will give back and Father, I thank you that as you do it, you'll give it back good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Father, I thank you right now that you would grant sleep and peaceful sleep. Father, that you would give rest in their spirit. Father, that the burden would be lifted, that the yoke would be destroyed. I thank you right now for doing the miraculous. I thank you right now for doing the impossible. Thank you right now for wake, making a way where there seems to be no way. I thank you right now for encouraging, for lifting up, for bearing up, for equipping afresh. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I anoint each one. Father, I thank you for the spirit of heaviness. You'll give us the garment of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The word of the Lord is to keep building. Don't put your hammer down. Don't put your saw down. Don't put the brush down. Keep building. Keep trusting. Keep believing. Hallelujah. Come on, let me anoint you anyway. Hallelujah. You're a part of the team. You're a part of the family. Hallelujah. And if the builders stop building, and if the builders stop cutting what needs to be cut, and if the builders stop hammering what needs to be brought together, 
And if the builders stop renewing what needs to be renewed, where will the ark be when the rain comes? What will keep you afloat when the floods begin to come? I want everybody in this place to put your hands toward these men and women of God. Come on, Mother, let me anoint you. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the grace to handle the weight of the assignment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There are so many of you, and it would seem that you are living in exile. That you were snatched from a place of comfort, snatched from a place of familiarity, and brought into a land that was completely foreign to you. But God said, Tell you, be not weary in your well doing, because there is a due season, and your season is due for you to reap. But this time your harvest is going to match your seed. This time the outcome is going to match the input. This time you're going to see the hand of God being revealed like you've not seen it revealed before. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want those of you who are close by just to come and put your hands in their back. And as you put your hands in their back, they're going to feel a Holy Ghost push this morning. They're going to know that the wind of God is at their back. They're going to know that the helper has come. They're going to know that the comforter has come. They're going to know that the consoler has come. of God. I thank you for a Holy Ghost push that has come to carry those who feel like they can no longer carry themselves. That the heaviness will be lifted. That the praise will begin to bubble up and spring forth. That there's going to be a brand new dawning of a brand new day. Your weeping has endured for the night, but joy has come this morning. You didn't have to look for it. It has come looking for you. You don't have to go after your blessing. Your blessing has come after you.
purposed and postured to do your will in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on and let's give God a good hand clap of praise all over the house. say, Pastor Jennifer, I don't know Jesus Christ as my Savior. I don't know Him as my Lord. But I want to know the forgiveness of my sin. I want to know I'm forgiven. I want to know my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I want to know I'm walking in the purpose that God has ordained for me. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand. God bless you. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Hallelujah. There may be other ones that I cannot see. God bless you. I see that one. I'm going to ask everybody all over this sanctuary to join me as I pray with these who have lifted their hands. And I want you to just say, Heavenly Father, I come to you. I confess that I've sinned. I've fallen short of your glory. But I thank you. I thank you. I thank you, I thank you that you love me so much that you looked beyond my faults and saw all of my needs. I thank you that you loved me when I was unlovable. I thank you that you've been patient with me when others have, forgive, have given up on me. And now I ask that you would come into my heart, forgive me, Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. Fill me with your spirit and make me whole. Now I confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart, that because of the blood of Jesus, I am forgiven, I am free, and I am saved. Hallelujah. Come on and put your hands together. If you prayed that prayer in earnesty and sincerity, God is coming to your heart. He saved you. He's cleansed you. And He has forgiven you. And that is a work that is not only being done in your heart today, but that is a work that God does day by day, moment by moment. And what a glorious work it is. Hallelujah. There may be someone here today who said, Pastor Jennifer, I want to become a member of Jackson Revival Center Church and how my heart rejoiced last week when I saw, I think it was nine people who came to join. Y'all don't ever have to wait on me to join. When God is doing the work, you respond to his prompting. But I am so grateful and as pastor, I welcome those of you who joined on last week. To God be the glory for the things that he has done. But if there should be some who are here today who say, I want to become a member of Jackson Revival Center Church, I'm going to give you the opportunity to come at this time. Come on, y'all, put your hands together for this woman of God. Hallelujah. Came in serving. Came in ready to work. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for these who are coming. Let me just tell you, I never take your coming lightly. I never take it lightly when someone wants to join Jackson Revival Center Church because you're not just joining an organization. You're not just joining a church. You're joining a family. And we want to welcome each and every one of you to our family. And I want to let you know, each and every one of you, you are an answer to prayer. The Lord gave us a word many years ago and said, I will send them from the north and the south and the east and the west, and I will send them of different colors and different complexions from different walks of life 
And we're watching God do just that. I know that's Brother Fabian. He's a member. Thank you for coming to stand with those who are joining today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I thank God for the elders and ministers who come to surround them. And now, Father, we receive them. And we pray this would be one of the best decisions that they've ever made. That, Father, you would bless them and they're coming in and they're going out when they're at work, when they're at leisure, when they're at rest. Father, we pray that you would bless the works of their mind, that you would bless the works of their hands. And, Father, that you would use them and give them peace. We ask that you would meet and supply each and every one of their needs. Father, let them be faithful in their attendance, faithful to give of their tithe and offering and faithful to give the gifts and talents you've placed on the inside of them. And Father, it is our covenant with them and our covenant with you that we will study the word of God, that we may rightfully divide the word of truth, that they may receive that word and grow thereby. Father, we promise to love them, to cover them in prayer. Father, to disciple them and to develop them in the things of God. Father, we will marry their young, we will bury their old, we'll answer their questions, we'll visit them in the hospital, we'll do life. Father, we ask that you would knit their hearts to this family. Father, that together we would be as one and we would work to occupy and advance your kingdom until you come. Father, we want to be found faithful upon your return. So we ask that as we put our hands to the plow, as it were, that, Father, we will not turn back. We will not give up. But we will stand on your word. We will stand in your truth. We will hold to your peace. And we will work faithfully until your return. Now we receive them as the newest members of our family, sons and daughters. And Father, we ask that you be glorified in the family that you have created here. We give you the glory, the honor, the praise, and we receive them in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen, and amen. We've got members of Team Connect who are right here behind you, and they're going to come and present you with a welcome card. Inside that card, there is a QR code. And if you would just scan that QR code with your phone, it'll pull up the membership application. Please go ahead and complete that application today. Anybody standing around you would be happy to help you fill out that application if you need any assistance. But we want to welcome you as the newest members of our Jackson Revival Center church family. Hallelujah. God bless you. It is my honor to be your pastor. It is our honor to be your family. And it is our honor to have you as our friends, our sons, our daughters, our sisters, and our brothers. May the peace of God go with you now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on and put your hands together and welcome them. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Well, we want to remind you once again, we've got midweek service this Wednesday night from 6.30 to 8. How many of you have been blessed by the midweek services this year? Hallelujah. That's, that's the hundred of y'all who come. Uh, I'm so grateful, though, for... Those of you who make the effort to come out midweek to get that refuel, to get that recharge, um, we have completed Church 101, uh, Essentials 201, and Discovery 301. And this Wednesday, we come for the conclusion of the matter. This Wednesday, we will be completing our growth track. And so we're going to have Shepherd Staff 401. Uh, and all of our ministry leaders, do not forget this this Wednesday, you are to, we're, we're having our ministry fair in the lobby during midweek service. But you're also going to hear a message from Pastor E. Dewey Smith 
called A Message from the Moon, and it fits perfectly with the last part of Growth Track. And so this week, we're going to get you plugged in. And so all of our ministry leaders, you're to have your ministry represented in the lobby for our ministry fair for those who have not yet gotten plugged in to get plugged in. And so we're excited about this Wednesday night. It's going to be a time of great impartation and a time of great celebration. So we ask you to come and join us from 6.30 to 8. And then also we have corporate prayer on next Sunday at 5 p.m. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, I'm going to ask you to reach over and grab your neighbor by the hand and just say, neighbor, I I pray the blessings of the Lord rest upon you, everything and everyone connected to you. May the spirit of the living God keep your heart, your mind, and your body in perfect peace. In Jesus' name, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Listen, can you one more time put your hands together and bless God for our worship arts ministry for the amazing job that they did today, for the amazing job they do every day. Minister Jason Gibson, Minister Matthew Donaldson, Minister Marcus Singleton, Sister Jillian Burt, Sister Kim Burt, Sister Jacobia Pittman, Sister Marquita Levy, Sister Victoria O'Harrell, And for all of our media team, under the direction of Elder Jeff Taylor, we give God glory and praise for you as well. We thank God for our worship, arts, ministry, the choir, the praise team, the musicians, Spirit in Motion, Messengers of God, my ministry, and the Jackson Revival Center Theater Ministry of Reconciliation. We thank God for all of you and for the beautiful presentation of worship you offered to the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen. I love y'all. We'll see you Wednesday night. For those of you traveling with us, meet us in the multipurpose building immediately. God bless you. Love y'all.